Hi. Really, really, really nice to be with you. And I have to say that I traveled a long distance to be here with you today and encountered quite a few unexpected conditions as I did. I had missed a flight. I had to deal with a dump of about eight inches of snow in my hometown of Minneapolis. And then, as I was going to the airport, found myself stuck in a snowbank and a very unwelcome extra half hour to dig myself out of it. And I did make that flight on time, so I am very happy to be here. <laughs> I have also navigated a number of unexpected changes on a personal level to be here with you today as a futurist. A futurist in the work that I do with people and organizations is to help them understand the changes that are coming at them and then to imagine inside of those changes what future would you want to create through a combination of analysis and creative play and thinking, then choosing it and moving towards it. Their job and your job, all of our jobs, is to be a catalyst for that change that you choose. It's a very common question for me to say, Cecily, what is a futurist? And the next question is, how do you get to be a futurist? Well, for me, it certainly wasn't the check that I put in a box when someone asked me, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Futurist wasn't on that list. But it was something that I grew into and evolved into, and as I pondered the question, thinking about being with you today, I recognized that many of the same principles and concepts that I use in my work with clients is actually applicable on a personal level. I love this poem because I think it really says it all. It's a poem by William Stafford. There is a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it never changes. People wonder about the things that you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and grow old. Nothing you can do to stop times unfolding, but you don't ever let go of that thread. That is really the feeling that I have had in following my own life and a thread that has pulled me forward. And I have, have really uncovered that there are about four phases that I have gone through in each of my reinventions. The first one is that there's a pull towards something, a pull towards something that in, in just kind of evokes a dream. I want to, I want to be, have. And in the pursuit of that dream, as you experience more things, ultimately there's a discovery, something you trip upon that just evokes and inspires a state of awe and wonder that the experience of discovery lets you know you have never seen it this way before. New possibilities emerge as a result. And then invariably, my experience, and I'm certainly most of you have had this experience as well, is that the dream you projected starts to differ with reality a little bit, and there's a tension. And that tension is that perhaps the dream no longer fits. Ultimately, you have to make a decision. Is when the dream no longer fits, or realities come up to fight you and bite you, there are choices to make. And I'm going to ask, uh, please, there is another slide that should be in the background now rather than these. So if you're able to make that switch, that would be terrific. For me, the first pull towards something was when I was five years old. My friend Elise and her older sister Anne would get dressed every day after school with their hair tightly wound in bonds, and they had on black leotards as they made their trick to ballet class. 
And I was so drawn to it. I just kind of admired. There was a, a, a beauty physically, but also of this kind of quiet seriousness that I really related to at five years old. And I asked if I could begin ballet classes, and so I did. And I continued on for about another 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> it was a long time and a lot of plies, I will tell you that kind of guided my life through several companies. I had the pleasure of dancing professionally with both ballet and modern companies. And always a sense that I was interested in more of the world. What I had thought of when I dreamt of being a dancer was that I was going to be touring the world, and that particular vision included, of course, uh, many stays uh, in Paris, hanging out in Parisian cafes with very cool musician types, taking part in salons. You know, I, I just kind of, there was, a, there was a spirit of the life that I was drawn to. So that curiosity, it was really the spirit of the life of, of, of really being a part of literature and culture and the humanities and that exploration of what it is to be human through those disciplines that had me finally acquiesce and go to college, got my uh, Bachelor's of Fine Arts, and as a part of that program, I had to take an anatomy class. And this anatomy class was legend. It killed pre-med students. It caused them to change majors. And here was I, somebody who hated math and science, had to take this anatomy class, and I made a discovery. I made a discovery as I was peering into cadavers that there was something very beautiful going on, something that I found ultimately incredibly compelling and that touched me in a way as I saw a design of how we were put together, how these little nubs of nerves coming out through our neck braided into this beautiful web that allows us to do this. And the design and the plan of it was the insight. It was the insight that then allowed me to be a better dancer and a better teacher. And also to start to see my place in the world, my physical body and that of nature, and the world in a whole new light. I, the person who thought I was going to do poorly in this science, did well enough, with enough excitement and enthusiasm that they invited me to come back and teach. And that began another pull. I taught for what began, became uh, another 12 years of anatomy and clinical sciences, as it followed me to Chicago, where I was dancing with a company and had really a privileged position with a the company there. And I was not happy. We were touring, not to Paris, not to Parisian cafes. And I was in that life also having to subsidize my full-time position through teaching ballet and dance kinesiology and, of course, waiting tables, as most dancers and artists do. It didn't bring out the best in me. I was crabby. I was catty. <laughs> About the other dancers. <laughs> And I knew that that wasn't who I was, and so I said, Summer, what are you going to do about this? And as I thought it through, does this a shift to another company, would that solve it? I realized that, in fact, it wasn't a situational issue, it was a conditional issue. That when I saw where I was happiest and where I was most alive, it was in the process of learning and growing and discovering new things, and that what was really important for me was that I have a life that allowed to do that. And so because that spark in anatomy about systems, I thought, well, I don't want to give up my career, but I also don't want that lifestyle, so I'll become a chiropractor. I had to go back and take at least two and a half years of science courses that I had put to the side, beginning with high school level algebra and chemistry before I could even get to chiropractic school, and taught my way all the way through it. That dream, that dream as a chiropractor was really about a practical solution to my dance desire. 
But what it did as it pulled me forward into learning new things about health and disease and how we were put together, I loved embryology, I loved neurology, I was teaching biochemistry, was that it also opened up new worlds. I studied homeopathy and Chinese medicine, and I put together this gorgeous clinic and a renovated loft and opened an art gallery next to it, five practitioners. It was a cool thing. And I was quite successful. I became someone that people wanted to know, how do you do that? And as a core piece of me, as naturally a teacher, I was beginning to consult. I was also as busy as I could be, and I could feel that tension arise, that tension that says, maybe this isn't at all. Maybe the dream is expiring. And that tension for me was actually pulled towards having family. So there I was at a conference in Germany, and I met a man who was a homeopath and an editor of a journal and a musician who thought I was everything. And I thought he was everything. And I thought I was going to have everything. So what I did was to make a very bold decision, which was to sell my practice, pack up all my belongings, let a lot of them go, and move to Germany to start a new life. This was going to be a life that would finally not have the Parisian cafes, but maybe German cafes, and all of the other senses of the, what I had dreamed of always. And I arrived there and discovered that none of it fit. That I was without belonging, without language, without culture, without a job, without family, without friends. And I also discovered that it was really about the darkest time for me that I have known in my life, where without nothing, I had to go back inside and go, what now? And there was a voice inside me that just was as loud and clear in my ears as I have ever heard, and it was, no, this is not okay. It does not fit. And what I had been experiencing through that time was a lot of insomnia, a lot of noise in my head about trying to make it fit, and if I just, if he just, if, 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 if. And what I realized in that surge of clarity of this is not a fit, is that it is that simple. That I don't need to think that hard. That all I need to do is pay attention. That I know that when I am on, when I am my best self, I don't have to think about it. That life really is that simple. And I decided then, in making the move to leave a bad fit, to live a life full of good fits only, that my job in life is to choose. Choose the people, the experiences, the work, where I show up the best. That's the only real power I have as I navigate the unexpected conditions that come at me. So I started my life, I knew, by following and pulling from the things where I had always done best. I pulled from the creative discipline that I had learned in dance. I pulled from the, si the systems thinking and the sciences that I had uh, um, and diagnostic methodologies that I had practiced as a doctor. And I started with what I had, which was people who wanted my help for their businesses. Because as far as I was concerned, strategy and answering any business-related problem had to relate to who are you and where are you going. And the combination of systems thinking and that kind of subjective process to actually realize new forms through the arts, I knew that. And I knew it in a uniquely valuable way. I've created my life from that place. Thumbs up. And now, as I work with clients to look ahead at the future, I have uh, brought it down into an analysis that it all comes ultimately when we look at changing conditions to four essential forces. Resources, 
technology, demographics, and governance. And typically when I speak to audiences, I'm speaking about those four forces and what it means for the future of healthcare, for manufacturing, education, government, and so forth. And I can tell you by what's happening in each of those force fields is that what we are in for now, our new normal is an endless state of volatility. That our power to choose and to guide and to be follow the pull and thumbs up is what we have to navigate this really rocky road. And that that is a practice. It is a practice every day. The dream, the discovery, the tension, and then finally the reckoning. How do I recalibrate who I am and where I'm going? That is a practice every day of small steps that make all the difference. It is a practice of courage. You don't wait for it to come to you. You practice it. It is a practice of optimism. It is a practice of curiosity. When you are stuck, get curious and keep moving. For it is really as simple as just keep moving, as if you were putting your oar in the water to row and row and row your boat gently down the stream. You don't know what's around that corner, but you do have the power to row it, and that stream has its own mind, its own current. And you want to do it merrily, merrily, merrily. Because your life, all of our lives, are nothing but a dream. Thank you.